I think it's important to know that anybody in this game has missed a spinal dural AV fistula. What makes it so complicated from your standpoint is that it's almost always compounded by some element of degenerative spinal disease. This is Dr. Brian Jankowitz, an associate professor of neurosurgery and the director of the Cerebrovascular Neurosurgery Program at Cooper University Hospital. I think most of us tend to have too high a threshold for performing a spinal diagnostic angiogram. And hopefully, by the end of our program today, you'll appreciate the technical challenges and the advantages of a good spinal angiogram in a patient with a suspected spinal dural AV fistula. Any spinal dural AV fistula that is diagnosed should be treated. And we can only hope that your threshold for ordering a spinal angiogram will be much lower. If, if this podcast does nothing more than puts spinal dural AV fistula on the differential of every neurologist, then we have done justice to society. More on this in a minute. I'm Jim Siegler for Brainwaves. Stay with us. Hey, podcast listeners. If you're a neurology resident and you plan on taking your boards this summer, you're probably asking yourself, how should I prepare? Well, you can start by checking out the annual Penn Neurology Board Review course, now in its 17th year. This high-yield course offers a broad range of online content, live in-person or teleconference discussions, and optional mock exams with up to 1,400 questions. If you're worried about COVID-19, the course offers more than 40 hours of video-based lectures and live streaming of the two days of case-based discussions, all featuring experts in the field. And if you're recertifying, you're also eligible for CME credit. So take a look at all that the Penn Neurology Board Review course has to offer by clicking the link in the episode show notes or just Google Penn Neurology Board Review course. Brainwaves listeners even get a special discount on the in-person and online content. Just use the promo code WAVES2020 at checkout. That's WAVES in all caps, 2020. For our program this week, Dr. Jankowitz joined me in the studio to discuss his experience with spinal dural AV fistulas, to review the neuroimaging and management strategies and so on. If you've never heard him speak before, he's the kind of neurosurgeon who will rattle off six reasons why that aneurysm should be clipped, or that one should be coiled. Or he'll ask you for at least three other conditions in your differential. One of the brightest guys that I know. Do you need notes or anything? Are you good? I don't think so. I mean, if... if but also hysterical. Do you have any linguistic mantras that you say before you get on mic? No, like how now, brown cow? Methodist Episcopalian. First question I had is, if you would mind just reminding us how the spinal cord is perfused. Perhaps the most difficult question of the day. I have always found perfusion to the spinal cord to be much more intricate and complicated than the brain simply because it's on a much smaller microscopic level that makes it difficult to visualize, therefore difficult to understand. In simplistic terms, you have three arteries running down the longitudinal axis of the spinal cord, the anterior spinal artery, which is derived from the two vertebral arteries, and the posterior spinal artery, which is actually also derived from either the two vertebral arteries or the bilateral posterior inferior cerebellar arteries. These two arteries run down the length of the spinal cord, giving off branches at each spinal level, which ultimately are called the segmental spinal arteries or the radiculomedullary arteries. And these arteries at each segmental level perfuse the spinal cord, but they're all interconnected and they're of varying size and they're of varying presence in the fact that some levels are devoid of these segmental arteries, and at some levels, they're greatly enlarged. For instance, there is the artery of Ademkevich. My whole medical career, I can't believe I've been saying it wrong. Being in the low thoracic region, typically on the left from T8 to T12. Which is anatomically important because that also happens to be where there's a less dense anastomotic network in that lower thoracic level. And again, that's the artery of Ademkevich. My medical school neuroanatomy teacher would be incredibly proud that I pronounced it appropriately. Dr. Carson Schneck, who actually runs the neuroanatomy lab at Temple University, would would be so happy to hear this. So 
more importantly than where the blood vessels come from, I think it's that it's a rich anastomotic network of interconnected vessels running up and down the spinal cord from stem to stern. So what is a dural AV fistula? How do they form? And why are they so problematic? Dr. Jankwitz and I talked about this next. Much like the vascular perfusion of the spinal cord, I think that AV fistulas are the most misunderstood, misdiagnosed, and confusing of the major vascular anomalies, thinking about aneurysms, AVMs, capillary telangiectasias, DVAs, and cavernous malformations. Once again, I think because we truly don't understand why they form or when they form, and they tend to evolve on a microscopic level that makes imaging incredibly difficult. To the best of our knowledge, we're not born with them, so we don't think they're congenital lesions, but by and large, dura fistulas arise from a traumatic event that incites neovascularization or possibly inflammation from either an infection or the sequelae of trauma. You know, it's interesting, the theoretical relationship between a spinal dural AV fistula and trauma, as Dr. Jankowitz mentioned. I mean, how many older adults injure their back? What are you doing? I'm stuck. I laid down, my back went out. Oh, well, don't you worry. We're going to get you out of here. Grab on. Y- you know, <laughs> Phil, this might not be the best. Thing. No, 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 no. I'm just going to rock you. You're not going to necessarily chase down a dural AV fistula because of that, are you? You need a better clinical story. Wait, why don't you just get someone who works here? No, this is going to work. And... Oh, oh, wow! Spasming, go! And the features of a spinal dural AV fistula are so heterogeneous that there's just no way to recognize it unless you're looking for it. I mean, how many patients feel weak in their legs following a back injury? How many older males have difficulty with urinary retention? Often because it's related to prostate enlargement. And yet, these are the symptoms that we see with dural fistulas. It shouldn't be surprising that one of the most common cases that is brought to court regarding a neurosurgeon is the care and specifically the misdiagnosis of a spinal dural AV fistula. In fact, just last week, I provided expert testimony for a missed spinal dural AV fistula. And there aren't many diseases that have a whole body of literature just simply describing how often or easy it is to miss the diagnosis. As a neurosurgeon, I'm completely biased by the fact that I tend to get involved only after there is a very high suspicion or or after it's already been diagnosed. To jump in here again, in that same vein, neurosurgeons like Dr. Jankowitz have this bias where a fistula is highly suspected and it's up to surgeons like Dr. Jankowitz to hunt it down. But also, neurosurgeons take referrals for degenerative disc disease and back pain, a far greater number of these than rule out dural AV fistula. So while they may have that advantage sometimes of knowing that, okay, I need to find the fistula, I do feel bad for them because they're our last line of defense, so to speak. And if they don't see it, the disease will progress. I feel for the doctors that have to live on the front lines diagnosing this disease because it can present with nothing more than insidious back pain. But this is where you have to use your spidey sense as a physician. Before we get ahead of ourselves, again, a spinal dural AV fistula is very rare. Population-based studies estimate the annualized incidence rate to be about 5 to 10 per million people per year. Granted, that's probably an underestimate because you have to be looking for it, and we often aren't. To heighten your spidey sense, as Dr. Jankowitz called it, you should be thinking about a dural AV fistula in your older male patients. Spinal dural fistula is five times more common in men than women, and the mean age of diagnosis is 55 to 60 years. And these patients have really poorly localizable symptoms. No real pain that drives a patient to seek medical attention. Painless, slowly progressive loss of neurologic function. Sometimes with patchy paresthesias at the lower extremities. Profound hypesthesias. Difficulty climbing stairs. Progressive inability to walk without some clear underlying anatomic cause. And later in the course of the disease, incontinence, erectile dysfunction, urinary retention. Progressive loss of bowel and bladder function. The patient could have lumbar disc disease, foraminal stenosis, osteoarthritis, or prostate enlargement. Dissatisfying, huh? Because I'm, no. I'm pretty dissatisfied. It's, it's, it is a very and all these conditions are far more common than a spinal dural AV fistula. If you're not looking for it, you know, you're going to miss it. Like if you're not looking for a venous sinus thrombosis, that's something else that I think about that you have to be looking for as a cause of an intracranial hemorrhage. 
every time I see an intracranial hemorrhage, I'm always thinking, could this be a venous sinus thrombosis? With this situation, you know, insidious lower back pain, maybe erectile dysfunction in an older person who could have some mild disc extrusion or some foraminal stenosis, how do I know that I need to chase this further and then send the patient to you? The good news is because de facto a spinal duralevi fistula has an arteriovenous shunt that typically pumps high pressure blood into a low flow system, veins, you usually see engorged veins on an MRI of the spinal canal. And you probably ordered that MRI looking for those other conditions like canal stenosis, myelitis, or root disease. Typically in the mid-thoracic region, it can extend as high as the cervical region and, and sometimes even be in the lumbar region. But particularly on a sagittal T2 of the spinal canal, cervical, thoracic, or, or the lumbar region, most of the time you're going to see dilated veins. If not, a tangle of serpiginous veins extending along multiple levels of the spinal canal. From at least one good case series out of UCSF, these T2 flow voids are more than 80% sensitive for the diagnosis of a dural AV fistula. And combined with the T2 hyperintense signal we see in the cord, which we see non-specifically with edema, that sensitivity grows to 100% with a specificity of 97%. The real problem is when there aren't engorged veins on the MRI. Fortunately, most of the time there are. Again, you'll see them more than 80% of the time. The only other way to ensure that you follow the path down the road of a Dralevia fistula is insidious onset, no clear event that brought the symptoms on, and a progressive neurological decline far out of proportion than a typical degenerative spinal pathology. What makes it so complicated from your standpoint, once again on the front lines, is that it's almost always compounded by some element of degenerative spinal disease. The patient may also have some pain, which could be related to the fistula. It's thought that some of these are induced by trauma, as we mentioned before, or the pain could simply be a red herring, completely irrelevant and coincidental. It's remarkable how often that the pain, even minor in nature, completely unrelated, will bring that patient to a doctor's office when in fact they've had progressive neurologic decline or loss of function that is much more apparent to you and less apparent or concerning to the patient. And let me jump in here and say that we've all got different thresholds of pain. Some patients may cry out for muscle relaxants and narcotics for the mildest degree of spinal canal stenosis. And some patients may have such profound radiculopathy with foot drop or hand weakness that the sensory afferent fibers are completely obliterated and the patient may feel nothing at all. So I tend not to put much stock in pain or subjective symptoms. What does the muscle bulk look like? What are their reflexes? I think most of us tend to have too high a threshold for performing a spinal diagnostic angiogram to rule out a spinal duralevi fistula. There's a stigma about spinal angiography, much like there was a stigma about cerebral angiography 20 years ago where the reported complication rates were exceedingly high and, and certainly unrealistic compared to how safe they are today. So I perform perhaps five spinal diagnostic angiograms a year looking for duralevi fistulas, and the vast majority are positive. So the positive predictor- The fact that the majority of angios that Dr. Jankowitz does to rule out a spinal duralevi fistula, the fact that most of these are positive, to Dr. Jankowitz, that indicates that we're probably not doing enough of them. There have to be many, many more cases of a duralevi fistula out there that we're missing. And there needs to be a lower threshold to consider a conventional angiogram, which is the gold standard for diagnosing the condition. Yeah, if we just plant the seed in the brain of a neurologist to look for this and can keep it on the differential, then we will save innumerable lawsuits for neurosurgeons who have missed this diagnosis. Because more often than not, I would say neurosurgeons are referred these patients to treat their pain and once you go down that slippery slope of being given a pain-generating diagnosis from degenerative spinal disease, it's very hard to get that patient off that inevitable cascade towards pain management and surgery. Anchoring bias, yeah. All right, seed is planted. You suspect a spinal dural AV fistula on the basis of progressive neurologic worsening, deteriorating power in the legs or incontinence of urine, dysesthesias of the thighs, and the patient's primary care provider or orthopedist, or maybe their neurologist, 
They order an MRI of the lumbar spine, and there is no significant orthopedic pathology to explain the patient's symptoms. What next? For some patients, you might be ruling out a myelopathy, B12, folate deficiency, copper deficiency, HIV. Maybe checking the cerebrospinal fluid for albuminocytologic dissociation, or you're going to get an EMG to rule out chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. Some patients may even warrant a brain MRI to look for a parafalcine mass, like a meningioma. And for some, when you're really starting to wonder, could this be a dural AV fistula? You'll want to get that angiogram. First of all, a spinal angiogram is a significant endeavor. I think it's important to note it does require catheterizing every segmental artery from L4 on up to wherever the segmental arteries end, which is variable and somewhere around T4 to T7. That means bilaterally from at least T7 down to L4, you are injecting an artery with contrast and using radiation to see what's going on. To give you a sense of the dose of the radiation, compared to a head CT angiogram, a conventional angiogram carries roughly five times more radiation. And if you think about the radiation needed for a carotid stent, the radiation needed to treat a vascular malformation of the spine is seven times greater than that. It is a tedious procedure that requires a lot of contrast and a surprising amount of radiation. That's one of the reasons why you might find us somewhat reticent to jump into a spinal angiogram. After the diagnosis has been made, the decision always revolves around one of three treatment modalities. Endovascular embolization. By far the least invasive modality. Radiosurgery. Using gamma knife. I should comment that spinal radiosurgery is still somewhat in its infancy. Not ready for prime time for most patients. And then our last treatment option for a spinal dural AV fistula, which is thought to be curative, would be open surgery which Dr. Jankowitz informed me can be very minimally invasive for some patients, i.e. those with a small dorsal dural AV fistula, or it can be quite invasive. Currently, I'd say that the vast majority of lesions are treated with endovascular means, usually using a liquid embolic agent to occlude the fistulous connection. Unfortunately, I'd say it fails in a significant number of cases. According to some older observational data, endovascular embolization fails as often as 25% of the time. And many patients ultimately require open surgery for curative therapy. The reason for failure of embolization is complex. And not only is every patient different, but we really lack randomized trial data and we have poor spatial resolution of our current diagnostic neuroimaging to know really if these treatments are effective at the microvascular level or if they may only be temporizing. What I mean by that is this. Dr. Jankowitz and others believe that the spinal dural AV fistula that you see radiographically on MRA or on the conventional angiogram, that's really just one head of the hydra. And you may have seen this where repeated attempts at endovascular treatment has created a monster. Has incited when you embolize what you see in that fistula, you're probably only embolizing the dominant component of the malformation. There are probably these microscopic vessels that we cannot even see. What we don't see are all of the other microscopic or dormant, angiographically invisible feeders to the fistula. And whether they're there or not, sometimes they come back with a vengeance, like the demon flytrap from The Little Shop of Horrors. Feed me! Feed me! The spinal perfusion is so rich and complicated that it is one of the few arterial systems that is nearly beyond our ability to discern, even with magnified angiography. So you will miss much of that microscopic anastomotic network that you cannot see and are nearly invisible to the human or angiographic eye. So the, I would say the complication rates for dural AV fistulas in the spine are much higher than intracranially. For example, you could occlude an important arterial feeder to the spine, causing cord infarction, which does happen a small percent of the time, although sometimes it's hard to know in these patients. Or you may not occlude the correct vessel, and the patient develops a worsening myelopathy, which can happen 20 to 50% of the time, depending on which study you reference. Because there is this resultant neovascularization, or recruitment of those microscopic feeding vessels that will ultimately regrow the fistulous network. In the end, it sounds very simple. You simply need to disconnect the artery in the vein. You need to find the fistulous connection 
and infiltrate that connection with typically a liquid embolic. Although to lead to a long-term or durable cure, that liquid embolic needs to traverse the fistulous connection and enter into and occlude the draining vein. And only enough of that draining vein that is pathological because parts of that draining vein can be draining normal spinal vasculature. So it's a very delicate balance. You can imagine why it's so complicated and why patients are often referred to major centers with highly specialized neurosurgeons for this type of procedure, especially if there happens to be an intraoperative complication of the endovascular approach. Well, the good news is that falling back on open surgery is always a possibility. And it's rare that endovascular treatment in the acute setting makes things more difficult with open surgery. In other words, embolization doesn't mean that you can't later proceed with an open surgical approach. So if you fail to cure a spinal delivery fistula with endovascular means, then I would quickly, and this is probably an important point, quickly transition to open surgery to avoid it recruiting further blood vessels and making it much more complicated. Because the vast majority of AV fistulas are fed by a single radicular medullary artery that if you know where it is anatomically, is relatively straightforward to knock out with surgery. But spinal delivery fistulas come in two general flavors, those located dorsally and those located ventrally. The dorsal fistulas being far more common and also being more accessible to treat with endovascular or surgical means. Because they're dorsal, they, are, they typically are easily accessible by a simple laminectomy, typically a one level laminectomy, and they're easy to visualize and easy to treat with nothing more than a bipolar and a small amount of coagulation. Then we have the ventral dural AV fistulas, which thankfully are less common, but unfortunately very difficult to reach because they are surgically inaccessible and typically associated with feeding from the interspinal artery, which means that they're much higher risk if you happen to injure or coagulate the wrong feeding artery. So you've made the diagnosis. Fortunately, you lowered your threshold to perform that spinal angiogram in your patient with an unknown cause of a myelopathy, and you found that dural AV fistula. What next? I always follow up these patients in the long term. Unfortunately, primarily because their spinal cord pathology is so advanced that they need months to years to recover. And I want to ensure that they are they continue to make progress over time. And two, because they're notoriously hard to treat, there is a significant number of patients whose AV fistula recurs when in actuality it simply wasn't cured the first time and there were anastomotic connections that weren't visualized that proliferate and reestablish the fistula. All that means is I always perform a short-term and long-term catheter-based spinal angiogram to ensure that these remain dormant and eradicated. That being, I follow up a cured, at least theoretically, spinal dural AV fistula with a spinal angiogram at three months, and then a repeat spinal angiogram at minimum nine to 12 months after that. For most patients who achieve a durable cure, they tend to show slow and progressive improvement in their motor function during this period, which is reassuring to surgeons like Dr. Jankowitz. There's also typical interval improvement in the spinal cord edema as the venous congestion resolves. So some physicians will perform interval MRIs to check on this. But really, the angiogram remains that gold standard for diagnosis and for follow-up. And would you agree with some of the literature that two-thirds of patients make good neurologic recoveries after their dural AV fistula has been managed? And then also, would you agree that some features or clinical exam findings tend to improve more so than others, like weakness or numbness or tingling, whereas incontinence and sphincter tone may not improve necessarily? As usual, the rule of thirds applies. Even though most everybody will experience some element of functional recovery, Still, a third are left devastated. A third of patients are left not significantly better even after cure, and a third do fantastically well, particularly those diagnosed early and, and treated aggressively. It seems to me that motor function always improves to the point where patients usually can ambulate, albeit with assistance. Bowel and bladder function tends to lag behind, and I find often does not significantly recover and leaves many people with long-term, at least urinary incontinence. 
sensory function is all over the place and I don't find it predictive or consistent with regards to its recovery. As we're wrapping up our program, I can't emphasize enough how low your threshold should be to perform a spinal angiogram or to refer a patient for one in any patient who has an unknown cause of a myelopathy, especially if they meet those other demographic factors. Dr. Jankowitz also had a good take-home message for you. I think it's important to know that anybody in this game has missed a spinal dural AV fistula or been tricked by it masquerading as a C67 herniated disc What's most important is that you keep it on the differential, that there is always time to put it back on the differential and refer for a spinal angiogram. I think it's also very important to find somebody that is comfortable diagnosing and treating this disease. Usually that is an interventional neuroradiologist or cerebrovascular neurosurgeon to make sure that you have somebody that you can contact at a moment's notice and just run it by them because there needs to be many more curbside consults regarding the possibility of this pathology being a spinal dural AV fistula and we can't leave them on the table because I think unlike many other pathologies and even some cranial dural AV fistulas the natural history of this disease is inevitably towards profound loss of neurological function and thus they should all be treated and they should all be diagnosed as soon as possible. It really was a coincidence, but not one week after I spoke with Dr. Jankowitz about this topic, I curbsided him about a patient of mine with a possible spinal dural AV fistula, and the patient went for spinal angiogram two days later. Turns out, he didn't have a spinal dural AV fistula, it was just really severe lumbosacral canal stenosis. But in the meantime, Brian became my go-to vascular neurosurgeon for these types of cases. So, like Dr. Jenkins said, keep it on your mind when you're seeing that unusual progressive myelopathy, or myelopathy that's not explainable by some osteoarthritic process, especially in an older patient. Because if you're not looking for it, it's one of those things that you really may not see. That wraps it up for another week of the podcast. Thanks so much for tuning in and special thanks to Dr. Jankowitz for joining me on the program. As always, if you're looking for more than what we covered in our program, please take a look at the show notes where the references are placed. And please remember that this podcast is for educational purposes only, not for clinical decision making. We're also happy to take your questions or feedback about the program. Just reach out to us on Twitter at Brainwaves Audio or email us at bweditorialboard at gmail.com. This episode of Brainwaves was produced by Brian Jankowitz and myself, Jim Siegler. We are supported in part by the Penn Neurology Board Review Course. If you're taking your boards this year, please check out the link in our show notes or just Google Penn Neurology Board Review. And if you think it would help you prepare for your licensing exam, you can sign up at a discounted rate using the promo code WAVES2020 with WAVES in all caps, 2020. Music for our program this week was courtesy of Kevin McLeod, Lee Rosevear, and Loyalty Freak Music. Our theme song was composed by Timothy Dalton. Sound effects by Mike Kunick and Daniel Simeon. I'm Jim Siegler, and I'll talk to you again soon.